You're listening to the British Baseball Podcast. Overall, it's been uh, pretty good. Um, just kind of still recovering my body and stuff like that. I've been going to the gym with a couple buddies and just kind of easing my way back into it. But and just kind of like um, visiting family, visiting friends, catching up. They're wanting to know about how the Italy trip went. So um, it's been nice, just kind of relaxing so far. That's cool. Oh, hopefully you got some great stories to share with them and uh, and the good listeners uh, on the podcast. Um, let's take people back then, because you're probably not a familiar face with a lot of people in the British baseball community. Uh, do you want to tell us a bit about yourself, Aaron, and um, how you got interested in baseball and where it all began? Yeah, so... Um... Actually, my first sport I ever played was um, soccer. <laughs> I played that for four years. Uh, then there was too much running, so I went to baseball. <laughs> Ain't not the truth. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> but soccer was a really good first sport for me. Um, helped with my athleticism, my footwork, and just to be aggressive and just go after it. But, um, yeah, played baseball when I was about eight or nine years old. Um, born and raised in Southern California. Um and just kind of continue to grow my love for the game. And then uh, eventually I went to uh, Servite High School in uh, Anaheim, California. That was a big part of like my uh, development as a player and also just as a human being. Uh, we got to compete in the Trinity League, which is arguably the best um, high school conference in the United States. So I got to play against first overall picks, guys who played in the SEC, the Pac-12, and just kind of had a really good foundation for me to like play against like some of the best ball players in the country. So Servite was a big part of my development. Then I transitioned into the University of Redlands. Uh, arguably that could have been the best four years of my life. Um, the people that I met there, my coaches, they just all believed in me and uh, just kept giving me confidence. And I just, I can't really say enough about how much that program meant to me in that city. Um, Redlands has a very close place to my, in my heart and um, I'll always love it. So yeah, that's kind of how that whole thing started. And then um, once I got done at Redlands, uh, I went to go play a little bit of pro ball in Mexico. I was playing in Monclova with the Acereros. And, I was going to uh, ask you about your, uh, your Mexico um session because there's not a lot online about your, your mexico time uh, playing pro ball and it's actually john from bat flipping nerds a great british baseball podcast over here um that he said make sure you ask aaron about his time in mexico so is there any uh, any stuff there you want to elaborate on yeah so uh mexico was it was really short brief but it was kind of a it was just a good experience overall so Originally, once I got done playing at Redlands, uh, didn't get drafted, didn't get signed. But uh, one of our um, players, his dad was an international scout. And he told me that, hey, I still think you can play at the next level. I have some connects in Mexico. Would you be interested? And I'm like, absolutely. Like, whatever you got, I'm open for the opportunity. So he made a couple phone calls. Um, the Acereros, they uh, called me back. Uh, they found out I was a fast runner. Uh, my fastest 60 yard dash was a six, six. And they were asking me like, Hey, like in our playoffs, would you be interested in just like being a pinch runner? And I'm like, I don't really care. Like, I just want to go out there and continue to play. Yeah. So they, they, uh, they flew me out there, um, did my tryout, ended up signing a contract to be on the reserve roster. So I never actually got to like play a physical game. And um, once they were about to get into playoffs, I got offered the graduate assistant coaching job at uh, Ottawa University uh, in Surprise, Arizona. So from there, um, that's when I had to leave, go back to the States, and uh, I started my coaching career. So what was is staying in baseball something you always wanted to do? Is that what led you into coaching? Absolutely. Staying in baseball whether it was coaching playing giving lessons I just feel like baseball and I we, we never have a day off I'm, I'm always thinking about baseball so it's yeah for sure interesting so uh, what sort of coach are you if if other people were to describe you as a coach what would they say 
Uh, if they were to describe me as a coach, I'm a big energy guy, high energy. Uh, I like tempo. I like to play hard. I like to play fast. And I'm just the kind of coach that's just always kind of moving around. Um, that's kind of my personality, I would say, in general, is I just I'm a big energy guy. And I feel like energy could be contagious in a dugout. If everyone's positive and moving around, like people feed off that. So I may not, I mean, I, I just feel if I'm in a good mood and I'm encouraging others and making them feel good about themselves, then that'll help translate when they play. So, yeah. Interesting. It's described online that, that you're coaching, you specialize in hitting defense and fielding. Uh, what are your sort of, best tips or advice for any of the young listeners or, or the older listeners like myself that are looking to improve the game in each area of hitting defense and fielding what is your top tip oh, let's see for hitting and defense it's kind of this is like a non-physical thing but you have to have confidence and you have to believe in yourself that's something as just a recruiter and as a scout um when i did do that is i look at body language and how players carry themselves on the field if you don't believe that, you know, you can hit the ball or you don't believe that you can catch and throw the ball to first base, that's you, you got to have that feeling in you in order for you to have growth. So I'd say confidence is a big thing that I look for for hitters, fielders, all that and uh, having fun. I mean, again, this is like you got to have fun and not be so serious when you play the game. I feel the best ball players are the ones that are always smiling having fun, playing loose. Uh, I think that's kind of where it all starts and just being coachable and wanting to soak up as much information and learn every day. Like those are the players that you want to coach. So I'd say when evaluating or giving any tips, start there and then eventually you'll get into the, the mechanics and all the other stuff that comes with it. Yeah. What age ranges do you coach? Uh, I've coached all the way from four years old all the way to – 24 oh, cool. I've, I've i've coached them all yeah i used to do uh summer camps in uh southern california uh, it's the mark cressy school of baseball so i'd have uh, we call them cone ones there, there's cone one cone two and based off your age you were on whatever cone you were so i'd get the cone one guys the little guys and i'd show them how to field a ground ball and then we played wiffle ball and they're just having fun and I don't know. I, f I feel like each um, age range is different on how you have to approach coaching with them, because if you're trying to teach a, a younger ball player about certain things that are a little more advanced, you, you can't you, they're not going to get the information. It's going to go in one ear and, and out the other. So you got to be smart with how you phrase things and you got to make it fun so that they continue to want to play baseball. So depending on the age range of who you're coaching, that's going to depend on what kind of information that you um, you give them. That's cool. You've mentioned the word fun quite a lot in this. Uh, what do you do then that makes your sessions fun? Fun. Uh, let's see. I love music. <laughs> yeah. So I like, I like to have music whenever they're kind of playing or doing any kind of uh, work, whether that's defense or hitting. Having some music in the background, it loosens the players up. I know when we were out in uh, Italy, um, Coach Mars and all, we always had like a speaker and the speaker would be in the dugout. It would be right behind the, the bubble when we're taking batting practice and guys are just moving around, they're dancing, they're, it's keeping everybody loose. So I feel like when you have that music around, it just, it makes everybody loosen up and, and just play free. That's what do you think is the best music to play ball to? Or at least <sighs> train to? Train to gosh, there's uh, there's so many. I'm I'm very uh, diverse in my music genres. Uh, I like rap, hip hop. I like uh, country, reggae, EDM. Just kind of depends on the mood and the day. Whatever comes out and it flows. I mean, I think country and reggae could be a little more relaxing and um, kind of the tempo is a little more smooth. But if you're trying to ha play with a little bit of bounce, confidence, you play the rap and hip hop. And then you have the EDM that's just like, boom, boom, boom. And you're just kind of just like, it just depends, it depends on the day, but I like them all. Did you ever try to make any track suggestions to a uh, coach Marcelino you know, or, or did he just. No, I actually, them? I'm, he, he has a, he has a good music, uh, good music taste. He, uh, it's good. I didn't, I never complained one time. He's really oh. good. 
No, yeah. no. He's if well when he's a uh, baseball stuff tries up, I think he should definitely move into DJing. Yeah, he definitely he's he's from San Diego, so he plays a lot of that uh that reggae and that cool vibe. Like it's a good vibe. It's really good. Yeah, it's it's highlight stuff that he puts on his Instagram for his videos. So not not a bad way to start the day. He's gonna put it that one. No. Nope, not That's at all. Pretty cool. Um so can you talk us a bit about you? You said that you weren't drafted. So mm-hmm. to set you back a little bit. Um how far towards getting drafted were you? Were you quite close or, or did you sort of have it in your head that you knew how it was going to go? Um, I kind of had an idea. I know, I, I mean, I played at a Division three school and a lot of times it's hard to get drafted or signed out of a D3. It happens. Uh, we had a couple guys from Redlands or one of our catchers and uh, one of our arms also signed, but it's just, um, I don't know. I think after my junior year, I had, that was my best year at Redlands. I put a lot of pressure on myself going into my senior year, knowing that, oh, I have to repeat the same kind of year in order for me to even have a chance. And I didn't have a bad year. My senior year, uh, it was still strong, solid, and did everything I could to help my team win. But I knew in the back of my mind that like, I wasn't going to get drafted and I wasn't going to get signed. So uh, there was a couple scouts. I know the the Braves. I, I had spoken with them for a little bit, and then the Mariners at one point. It was nothing super serious. It was just kind of like, "Hey, we're watching you today." Or those are the only kind of two teams that I knew were watching, from what I know. But um, yeah, no, I just kind of um, I knew at the end of the day I wanted to get my degree. That was kind of like the most important part in this whole entire aspect. Yeah. Um, I'm the first one in my family to go to college and, you know, get a degree. So uh, that was really important for me. And um, baseball just helped me along the way. So I didn't really see past past that. But if there are any opportunities arose or arised, I was going to take it. That's brilliant. Well, I'm, I'm glad Dan, you mentioned that the, the baseball sort of came second to, to your degree. And um, so you went to, because so, I was going to ask, ask you, sorry, uh, how did you deal with the disappointment of, of not being picked up? And was there any sort of advice you can give there to, to young athletes if they're having a bit of a slump, how they can sort of overcome um, that sort of disappointment? Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's definitely, uh, it sucks, especially when you feel that you're capable of playing at the next level and you've had people your whole life saying that, oh, you can definitely do this and, you know, whatnot. But at the end of the day, a lot of that stuff is out of your control. Uh, you just got to go out there and and just try to help your team win and have fun because I think when that kind of stuff uh, happens in life, it's just kind of um, – it's like, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to sulk and continue to dig a deeper hole? Or are you just going to say, all right, it happened. It is what it is. Like, what am I going to do now in order to, uh, you know, continue to better myself and whatever I do in life, whether that's baseball, your job, anything of that nature. So I'd say like the best advice when you kind of have any disappointment like that is honestly just to accept it, be aware of what happened, but find different ways in order to, to still motivate yourself and um, just kind of keep going, keep going forward because you're going to get a ton of disappointments in life, things that you thought you should, you should have had or whatever the case may be, but doesn't mean you can't stop what you're doing and not progress. So just, um, just keep going, big on, keep going. That's really cool. So how did you find out then about uh, your GB eligibility uh, through call? Do you remember where you were when you got the the call or the, or the message about the national team? Absolutely. So, um, funny story about that actually so I was coaching at Ottawa in Surprise Arizona and one of our players was Ivan Quackenbush who played on the U23 team and he was obviously with us the whole trip in uh, Turin and uh, I was throwing batting practice to him and we were just kind of talking and stuff and um, I heard that he was from um, England and I was like oh yeah like are you like what part of London are you from and this and that and I'm like, oh, yeah, my dad was born in London. And he's like, no way. He's like, you can play for Team GB. And I'm like, uh, like, I'm like, quack. I haven't played in like two years, bro. Like, I'm, I'm a coach now. I hit fungos. I throw batting practice. Like, 
He's like, oh, no, like, you definitely can. Like, I'm going to call, uh, I'm going to call Drew Spencer and just tell him about you. And I was like, all right, like, I go for it. Like, if, if, if you think I can, then I'm all ears. And then eventually there was, it was, I want to say it was like a random Tuesday. Uh, I was in our, our shed. We were getting the pitching machine out, grabbing baseballs for practice. And then um, Brad Marcelino, he uh, Instagram DM'd me. And he just reached out and said, hey, Aaron, um, spoke to your college coach, Aaron Holly at Redlands. And I heard that you're passport eligible. Um, wanted to know if you're interested in another playing opportunity. I coach for Great Britain. Uh, you know, give me a give me a phone call. And I was like, what just happened? Like, this is like and I had followed Mars before he had even sent me that message because I always watched his hitting videos. Yeah, yeah, yeah who he was working with. And I'm like, this guy's like legit. He's big time. And then when I saw him DM me and I'm like, what just happened? Like, I was just, I was like, what's going on. And then eventually I, I spoke to him over the phone. He kind of gave me the details. And then I spoke with my family about it. And I'm like, I feel like this is like a once in an opportunity lifetime. Like, like, like you just gotta, you gotta do it. You just gotta send it. So got all my paperwork in, um, eventually got my passport and then after that um everything everything happened i ended up getting on the plane to italy and we did it what what we what was going through your mind then when when you got on the plane uh to to go to to what what were your sort of thoughts and expectations heading into it uh definitely nervous definitely excited probably more nervous than excited i put in a lot of work prior um just i went to san diego a couple times to go hit with uh with mars and ts and uh, i definitely went and went to the gym and was hitting every day like i had a routine but i just didn't know how it was actually going to turn out because everything changes when you face live like you can go in the batting cages you can take ground balls but the minute you know the lights turn on and you're facing another team and a pitcher and you have to get on time and I didn't know how I was going to do like deal with that, having not done it for two years and how my body was going to react to it. But um, I don't know. I just, I, I went, I went in there with the intentions to do well. I was super confident. I just didn't know that it was going to go like this. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, thought, I was just like, Oh, I'll go there and I'm going to try to help the team win and compete and bring positive energy. And let's just kind of see what happens. Like I, I have nothing to lose. Like I'm out there going, just try my best and help us win games. So I kind of went in there with that mindset, not really putting a ton of pressure on myself, which probably helped me. Um, and um, it all worked out. Best finish for GB since 2007. And, yeah. and I think uh, this program is just, it's, it's, it's on the climb. It's going to continue to rise. And I'm really excited in the direction that we're heading. Yeah, definitely. You're not the only one there. There's a, a lot of us that we're watching, and I had a, some uh, some fun memories of that tournament, and that was just from sitting there watching it. So again, we're, as we get into this, I'm, I'm pretty sure we'll, we'll find out some more of yours. Um, were there any particular players or coaches that made you feel really welcome when you you arrived in Italy that you want to maybe give a shout out to? Yeah, both the the Dutch and uh, Israel. They're really cool. I think I felt like whenever I was on base, I was either chit chatting with one of the players and um, I don't know, they were just, there's sometimes when, you know, you play other opponents, they're so serious and they're just like in strictly like game mode and they don't want to talk, but there, uh, I believe I talked to the second baseman at Israel I think is Mitch. I want to say Mitch, I, don't know, I forgot his last name, but we spoke a little bit and then I uh, spoke to a couple guys on the Dutch team and um they're just nice guys they were just really friendly and i just i knew that they were really good ball players and it's fun playing at a high level against yeah. like high level like you want to play against the best and both those two teams were in the championship and they're great you know yeah. they're, they're... what about from the gb side gb side oh like like players wise yeah players coaches who, who who did you click with the most who, who did you get on well with Oh gosh, I felt like a, I'm trying to be like, I kind of clicked with everybody. Like we, we were in a hotel for a couple of weeks and uh, we couldn't leave the hotel. So we, we spent a lot of time together. 
uh, we're all on the second floor. We had a table where we play cards and listen to music. And uh, it was cool. My roommate was uh, Gabe, Gabriel Rincones. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, guys, uh, he's a good guy. Good guy, Gabe. Got to, got to know him really well. Um, but just he's, he's a young guy, too. 20, 20 years old and so much talent. And uh, I'm really excited to see, uh, you know, his growth, both as a person and as a player, because he has so much upside. He's yeah. a very, very exciting player. And uh, it was good to be around him. Then uh, another guy, um, shout out Grant Carey. Uh, <laughs> he was just like a, an energy guy. He's, I feel like him and I are very similar. It's like he walks in a room and you know, you're, you're happy, you know, he's going to say something funny and just kind of bring the, the energy up. So um, I thought Grant Carey just really helped uh, the team be loose and um, have fun. So Grant, I'm trying to think of anybody on the, on the pitching side. Um, shout out Ethan Solomon. <laughs> that guy, he's like, he's like a second dad. <laughs> to all yeah. of us. He was, uh, he was great. He, um, he just, I think he, he knew like to say the right things and he was just uh, so positive. I felt like he, uh, he was just a, a really good person to be around. And uh, I just, I looked up to his leadership and his wisdom. He was a really good, great guy. Uh, being a coach yourself then, uh, what did you learn or pick up from the Great Britain coaches uh, when you were over there? <sighs> That, uh, that coaching staff was amazing. Um, the scouting meetings that we would have for hitters, and uh, I obviously I didn't get to go for the pitchers meetings, but our hitting meetings were, like, legit. We all had, like, our paperwork. We all had – they had videos of each pitcher that we were going to possibly see, you know, what they threw, their velocity – their position players who runs on the other team. What do you got to do? Do we need a, the, I felt like they had, they were so well prepared and I, I just really admire that because that does take an immense amount of time to, um, to get all that information and be able to present it to players. So shout out to the GB coaching staff, everybody. Uh, I think they did a phenomenal job in preparing us the best that they could. And uh, I, Again, I can't thank can't thank them enough for what for all that they did. Uh, on the topic of coaches as well, uh, which coaches have made or, or which people have made the the biggest impact on you as a player and as a coach? Uh, throughout my whole career, or GB? Just what do you like? Just, much with, yeah, the most influential coaches and people. Mm, wow, gosh, let's see. Uh, <laughs> One coach at the University of Redlands, Ryan Garcia, um, him and I have a really good relationship. Uh, we're both very cerebral in terms of how we think about baseball and hitting and defense. Like him and I, uh, he actually was recently uh, in Arizona. He was out scouting for the University of Redlands, and I got to take him to the airport yesterday. And I don't know, him and I just have a really good relationship both on and off the field, and I felt he – uh, always believed in me as a ball player, uh, kind of giving me confidence that I was better than what I really was. And eventually, like, I'd start to believe it. And uh, I don't know, he just played a really uh, big part in my development as a player. And he probably throws the best BP I've ever, ever faced. Sorry to any TS, all these other guys that throw BP. <laughs> but uh, Ryan Garcia's BP is is legit. So, um yeah, I think Ryan Ryan's up there. Um, one infield coach that I felt was uh, was pretty big uh, in my development was Scott Stroud. Uh, he was my coach in high school. He was amazing. Uh, he was just uh, very competitive, very fiery, and uh, he knew me as a player and how to get the best out of me. So he would just say the right things at the right time in the right tone. Uh, sometimes like I need a coach to get in my face, uh, especially when I was younger, because when I was a young, uh, a young player, I was uh, very emotional if I, if I had a, made a mistake or anything and I would show it out on the field and he light me up for it. But as you get older and a little more wiser and as you're a coach, 
you um, you just start to understand that part of baseball a little bit better. You understand that you're going to fail a lot and people are looking at your body language. They want to see how you react when you make an error or how you react when you have a bad at bat or two bad at bats. Like the game's not over yet and your teammates are still, you know, counting on you to make plays, be positive and things like that. So I got to learn that uh, a little bit later in my career, probably later than what I would have hoped, but I feel I have a pretty good, um, good grasp of it right now. So shout out to coach Stroud and coach Garcia. And there's plenty, plenty, plenty more. Um, I, I just, I can name a ton of them, but those two just right off the bat. I've, I've noticed the uh, Derek Jeter uh, picture behind yeah. you being a shortstop yourself. Is, is Jeter one of your, your heroes? Oh, absolutely. Captain. Yeah. He uh, did everything right. Did everything right. And he was just a winner, uh, straight up winner. Uh, Derek Jeter's just uh, always been my, always been my guy ever since I was growing up number two. And he just, um, I think he just kind of the professional professionalism that he has. He was just a professional. He was a pro pro did everything right. And um, love his story and love everything he's about. Uh, can I take you back to some other GB stuff? Um, mm-hmm. How how did you personally prefer, prepare for your, for your first game? First game, wow. Uh, so, so extremely nervous playing against France. And it was a, a night game too. So you had the lights on. And uh, I, the one thing I do remember from that game is I was sweating profusely, like <laughs> – I, I remember I had to like, I had another undershirt. I had to take my undershirt off because I usually wear like an undershirt because it was just dripping wet. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, like I need to calm down. I need to relax. I need to hydrate. And um, I don't know, that game was just, uh, it was kind of a blur, but it was, uh, I mean, Alex Webb just absolutely dominated. He pitched so well. And um, it was really impressive to see um, Alex Crosby and uh, Kent Blackstone just they just hopped off a plane uh, coming back from indie ball and they like show up the next day and then just rake and it was that was just a, a fun game to be a part of especially to get that first win out of the way too and kind of just like kind of take that deep breath I'm like all right got that first one out you know so um, it was uh, there was a lot of nerves I knew a lot of my family and friends were watching because the just the time difference it was uh, easier for them to watch night games uh, here in the in the states so I knew a lot of um, friends and family were watching and um, it was cool I think uh, once I kind of got that first game out of the way uh, my nerves started to settle down a little bit and then we played Russia obviously in game two and then once I got my uh, my home run, I think um, that whole entire like tournament kind of just like changed for me. The, that confidence in the box and uh, the belief that like, oh, yeah, like I still can play at a high level. And I think I just kind of carried that confidence all the way uh, throughout the tournament. That's brilliant. Uh, yeah, you, you probably well, we, we talked about the stats before we, we started recording. Um, you are arguably one of the, the best players. And I know people have watched the game have also said like you were one of the best players in the team. Um, so what what were what were your personal tournament highlights? So we've mentioned the home run, but it's um, what what are your favorite memories from the Italy trip? Ah, uh, favorite memories on the Italy trip. It was just kind of being out on the field with with all the guys. Um, I mean, I think. Uh, I mean, not having played for two years, you kind of, you take, you just take for granted, like just being out in like in the dugout with the guys and just in between innings, getting ground balls. Like there were so many times where I'm just like, I was just talking to myself, like, I'm just so blessed and grateful to be like out on a field right now and competing. And I was telling some of my buddies here that like, there's not a lot of people in the world that get to like go on a bus and put their headphones in and know that they're about to go somewhere to go play a baseball game and like compete in a game that like matters and just like the exciting nerves and just the not a lot of people get to get to experience that and I just I love to compete I love to you know play hard and just and just help help my team win and um 
there's so many different memories that I guess I can kind of, you know, maybe pinpoint whether it's like, oh, I remember this play that I had against this team, or I remember when, you know, Blackstone leads off the game against the Dutch single and we score first against them in that first inning. Like, that's like, like that's like a statement against a team like that. We went and scored first and, uh, you know, there's just, there's so many different things that I think could have uh, maybe came up, whether it's this one or this one, but overall just being in the dugout with my coaches, with my teammates and the jokes and the stuff that we would say, it's, uh, that's the stuff that I'm always going to remember. That's cool. Um, looking back over everything so far, uh, would you change anything if you, if you could do it over again? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Wouldn't change a thing. Uh, I do believe everything happens for a reason. So I just uh, wouldn't change, wouldn't change a thing. I think everything happened the way it was supposed to happen. And uh, that's how it's going to continue to happen. Uh, I think uh, life is just very unpredictable at times, but you just got to ride the wave and just go where it takes you. Yeah. Indeed. Um, another question for you here. Um, Coach Spencer uh, Drew, he he came up with something that I think it was about a year and a bit ago when lockdown came in. He was asking uh, people for baseball stories, and it's basically if you never got the chance to play baseball again, what would your favorite memories be that would make you grateful to the game? Never got to play baseball again. <sighs> I don't know the the recent one that I just I believe just comes to mind for me. It was um, my last game against the the Czech Republic. I remember I was uh, in the outfield. Uh, we were just like probably ten minutes, fifteen minutes before the game, and I was just kind of just kneeling down, kind of looking around the whole stadium, kind of just soaking everything in because. I mean, technically, I mean, it's everybody's last game. Nobody knows if they're going to continue to play after this. Um, but for some reason in my heart and everything that was going on, I felt like it wasn't going to be the last game that I was ever going to play. I felt it was different from when I played my last game at the University of Redlands and I'm at shortstop and I'm just like, wow, like this is my last time doing it all here. Like, I can't believe it. Like, I'm numb. But when I was out there against, you know, the check and we're about to play, there was just something in me that said, no, like this isn't your last game. And I think all those emotions and just I was so grateful and blessed. And I'm like, wow, like this is a uh, I don't know. I, I just I love baseball. I'm grateful for the opportunity to still be playing at the age that I'm at. And there's so many players that I played with and played against that are no longer playing anymore. They're off doing whatever you know they're doing and i'm like i'm i'm still playing baseball and uh not, not a lot of people can say that they do that so i'm very fortunate and blessed so have you started playing again now that you're back home to sort of keep yourself fresh and active uh haven't swung a bat or thrown a ball yet but i have uh lifted and stuff like that i kind of wanted to take a couple weeks to just kind of just just relax for a little yeah. bit i think i think my body um those two weeks really really beat me up um i felt i was in good physical shape coming into the tournament but i felt i wasn't necessarily in baseball shape there's like two differences and uh i remember my hip flexors were super tight after my first like nine inning game and then you know the next day we play russia and then my like hamstrings are getting super tight and then when we played israel I actually tweaked my hamstring on a, on a double It's like my last at bat. I, I felt something pop. And then I remember skip takes me out of the game. Cause he just saw me kind of moving around and I'm just, yeah. so he, he took me out of the game. And ever since that, like, I was like, I could like barely, I, I could walk, but it, it was tough. I had to, uh, Alan Dean, Dino shout out to him. Yeah, yeah. Train. He was amazing. He, you know, stretched me out, loosened me up, gave me all the ibuprofen that I could possibly ever want. And um, I also had like my hamstring, I had it like taped up and stuff before each game. Cause it was just like, it was really like, it was tough for me to move. And uh, I think a lot of that just, my body wasn't used to playing a ton of nine inning games after not having doing it for two years. So I think it was just kind of, um, it was tough, but 
that's why I'm taking these two weeks to just kind of ease into it. And probably uh, starting next week, uh, I think I'm going to go back, start swinging a bat, getting on a throwing program and uh, kind of just starting to get back into it. I forgot to mention we're talking about music before as well. Um, friendly show, John Baxendale, who is now one of the um, umpires in uh, British baseball. He says he's come up with a song for you to the tune of the Nolans, I'm in the mood for dancing. Now, <clears throat> with me having this amazing voice as it is, also being a bit bit uh, sniffly, I'm going to try my best not to butcher this as much as it's already butchered. There we go. Because we've come to cheer for Adam Singh. So come on, swing. Ooh, hammer that ball tonight. He says he blames that on being spent far too long in the in the car. Uh, what, what, what do you think? What do you think? Oh, I, I like it. Aaron Singh, swing. Uh, you know, it all rhymes. It flows. I think that's pretty good. <laughs> Shout yeah. out to it. <laughs> nice one, John. Yeah. There you go. He likes it. Uh, I didn't think I was going to do that. Well, just shows what uh, flu, yeah, great flu medicine will do to you. <laughs> Yeah, great job. Great vocals. Thanks, man. Too kind. Um, right, that brings me up to the last three questions that I have. So I'm just going to load these up. Uh, I like to call this the bottom of the seventh. Uh, last three questions. Uh, answers are going to be strikes or, or hits, depending on how you answer them. And then you'll have the chance to walk it off the end. So uh, do you have any hidden talents? Hidden talents? Uh, uh, no, I, I, I don't think so. There's nothing that's kind of surprising for me. Um, I just like to play baseball. I like music and I like working out, hanging out with my friends. I'm a very simple guy. What are you most afraid of? Uh, birds. Birds? Birds, birds are a no for me. Uh, I had a bad experience with birds when I was about four years old and I thought one chased me and probably like, crossed my my head and i just whenever i see a bird i just kind of i get a little nervous but i i, I can walk past them we're, we're good but people that know me know that I, i'm not a bird guy not okay, a so. bird guy. all right uh, um do you have any guilty pleasures guilty pleasures uh no i'm not a big um not a big netflix guy i don't i don't really watch a ton of a ton of movies i know no not anything that comes to mind. No guilty pleasures. I'm, I just do my thing. I'm, I'm a believer that there's no such thing as guilty pleasures. You like what you like. You shouldn't be ashamed of it. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I totally agree. All right. It's tradition on the show to give the last word to the guest. So, Aaron, thanks for being such a great uh, guest. And thank you for, for taking the time to share your experiences about the European trip. It's been great to have you on. So uh, any any parting advice or any shout outs you want to give? The floor is all yours to do with as you wish. Uh, no, I uh, appreciate you just getting me on the podcast. This is my first podcast that I've ever done in my entire life. And uh, I've been wanting to do one. And finally, I got one. So just shout out to you for reaching out and wanting to do this. So thank you very much. And uh, just I want to thank everyone who's been a part of my life, uh, my friends, my family, my coaches, everyone that I just believed in me. And I got so much love on social media from um, just all my players and people that have been involved in my life. And they saw the success that I had. And I can just tell that they were genuinely happy for my success. And I'm happy that I went out there and, you know, did what I did. And, you know, I'm just very grateful for that. And um, I just want to thank everybody for believing in me and I'm excited to see kind of what happens next in my career. And I want to continue to play and play at a high level and just let the chips fall where they fall and uh, excited to help uh, GB continuing their, uh, you know, their push forward. And uh, I'm just uh, excited for life and ready to keep going. Thank you so much. everybody. No I'll, I'll give you a little secret as well. Well, it's not really a secret. A lot of people know it's, I'm not very good at doing this. Uh, there are there are a lot of lot of people out there do, that do a lot better job at uh, baseball podcasts and podcasting in general than I do. So if any of those people are listening, I'm going to tell you what a lot of people have already told me. Aaron is an absolute top dude. He is eager to be on on shows as this is his first podcast appearance. He deserves better. So why not get in touch with him, uh, Aaron? Where can we find you on social media? Uh, social media on Instagram and Twitter. It's uh, Aaron Singh. Uh, then there's three H's at the end. So 
Aaron Singh, three H's at the end. You'll find me on Twitter, on Instagram, and uh, that's it. No TikTok. No TikTok. TikTok. Not yet. Not, not yet. Maybe, though. Maybe. 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 maybe, maybe but not right It'll be now. a guilty pleasure thing there. Uh, but yeah, yeah if, if, if you want to chat <laughs> sure, with Aaron, podcast is get in touch with him. You will not regret it. And uh, I'm sure you'll get a lot more information out of him, too. Aaron, cheers for this. I uh, really appreciate it. All the best with the rest of your day. And I'll speak to you soon. And that's that. The end of season two. Uh, thank you to all my guests, especially those who contributed to the 100th episode. I still can't believe that that milestone has been achieved. Uh, thank you um, for your precious time and your knowledge and your insight into your lives and your history. And uh, I hope I haven't let any of you down. Um, I continue to do this because of you lot, the the uh, British baseball community, the, the baseball community, uh, your listeners. Uh, thank you for listening. Um, even when I haven't been at my best, when I feel like my work hasn't been the best, your feedback has helped, uh, your support and uh, your, your listeners' questions are, have always been um, valuable to me. Uh, thank you to Jocelyn and Elliot at home for being so supportive and understanding and for being so loving. Uh, to Manchester Baseball Club, to all the British baseball clubs, uh, players, staff, scorers, uh, everyone, whatever you're involved in British baseball, keep promoting your team, keep championing this great sport in this country and keep suggesting great guests. Uh, it's the off-season now for the players. Um, so while they're getting their work in with batting and, and throwing, I'm going to get the work in to try and get better at doing this show for you. <laughs> Some might say I can't get any worse. Um, but I really want to pride myself on getting the best content to as possible. So I know I've got a lot to work on for next year. Um, but, you know, um, I'll still be around on social media at Brit Baseball Pod. Or you can follow my personal account at Sol City Biggie. No, don't ask. Um, but yeah, uh, stay in touch. I'll be back around about March, April 2022 time. So I hope you'll be back too. Um, I'll leave you this little quote from Yogi Berra. Uh, Love is the most important thing in the world, but baseball is pretty good too. And so are you lot. All right. That's all from me this week uh, for this this season. Uh, take care and I'll see you soon. Ta-ra. <laughs>